Good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas Metzger, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of all the organizers to this small series of webinars prior to our workshop on the uh, ultra-fast antiferromagnetic writing on the 9th and 10th of May next week. Together with our colleagues from Prague, St. Petersburg, Nijmegen, and Mainz, our goal was to bring together the leading experts with uh, the ultimate goal to identify the next steps to initiate a breakthrough towards the fastest and the least dissipative writing of antiferromagnetic bits. To uh, stimulate the participation of early stage researchers in this workshop, we organized this mini webinar series um, with uh, experts in closely related but uh, already established fields. Uh, so yesterday we had lecture on the theory of antiferromagnetism. Today will be ultra-fast magnetism. We will meet the senior editor of Nature Nanotechnologies and um, antiferromagnetic spectronics. Um, all these lectures are given prior to our next week's uh, in-person conference, and they're hosted in the same fashion as the prestigious Spin Plus X seminar series. So around one hour of talk, followed by some time reserved for questions. Um, since those lectures are organized in a Zoom webinar format, all attendees are muted. And uh, to ask a question, please just raise your hand or uh, write in the Q&A, also the chat is enabled. Um, your question will be then directly forwarded to the speaker or um, you will be promoted to be a panelist and you can ask them yourself. Um, keep in mind that all the talks will be live streamed on YouTube and also be available later there. Um, today's lecture will be given by Professor Alexei Kimmel. On uh, Thursday, uh, as I said, Dr. Benjamin Heinrich of Nature Nanotechnology uh, will provide a webinar at 11 a.m. And on Friday, we will have a lecture by Professor Thomas Jungwirth on the antiferromagnetic spintronics. That being said, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Alexei Kimmel and to thank him for delivering this lecture after being initially responsible for initiating our next week's um, conference. Uh, Alexei Kimmel is full professor and chair of our group um, here in Nijmegen at Radboud University. Uh, the group is the ultrafast spectroscopy of uh, correlated materials. He is a very well known and highly respected expert in the field. Um, Alexei graduated in 1997 with a Master of Engineering from uh, St. Petersburg State Electrotechnical University. Um, and then in 2002, he received PhD under supervision of um, Professor Roman Pisarev. He came to uh, Rappard University in Nijmegen first as a postdoc, then as uh, assistant associate, and since 2017, full professor um, here. His research interests um, are ultrafast phenomena in various material classes, um, predominantly in ferry and antiferromagnets, um, and also how to manipulate magnetic order to obtain the fastest and least dissipative um, writing. He received many awards, um, for example, the, the Veni and uh, uh, Vidi grant in 2004 and six. Um, is our grant, uh, the mega grant in 2013, and he is a distinguished scientist and recently received the Rappout Science Award in 2017. Um, with that, I will stop uh, share my screen and I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Alexei to share your screen and start whenever you like. Yes. Okay, do you see it? Uh, do you see the screen? And on proper mode? I see it, it's perfect, thanks. Okay, good. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for a very uh, kind introduction, for being uh, uh, the chair and the main organizer of this uh, webinar series. I hope uh, indeed we can get uh, uh, more interested uh, young uh, scientists uh, at the workshop, uh, actively asking good, very good questions to, uh, to speakers, so that's a discussion uh, is one of the um, main 
It, 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 a very good discussion is one of the things that we are missing in the corona time. So we, we want to reestablish these uh, discussions at the conferences and then discussion between the, uh, between the talks, uh, after the talks, and uh, hopefully get new ideas at the workshop. And uh, today I wanted to talk uh, about, uh, well, I wanted to, to make a general introduction into the problem of ultra-fast magnetism and uh, to show you that uh, when, uh, when, uh, uh, when certain approximations, conventional approximations and uh, magnetism uh, and uh, classical magnetism do not work, then you can expect a plenty of counterintuitive uh, phenomena and some of them I will, uh, examples of those phenomena I will show you uh, in, in the talk today. If you have a question, please don't, do not hesitate to, uh, to uh, type it uh, in the Q&A uh, se uh, session. Uh, or maybe raise the hand, we'll see how to address it in the best way. Uh, also uh, learning here, giving uh, lectures under these uh, formats. So maybe Thomas, maybe we can uh, we can stop in between uh, after twenty five minutes and check if there are questions. Then uh, we can uh, I can answer questions uh, in between uh, the talk. If it's in the middle of the talk, not to not to wait till the very end. I would uh, let you know if there are some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. So let's start. Uh, well, let me start a, a bit from a too general introduction. Say uh, we can we we uh, in the last uh, decades we experienced uh, a real revolution in in, in, uh, da in uh, uh, data uh, communication and telecommunication. So that due to the invention of uh, optical fibers, our internet became uh, fast, and then we can uh, transfer information literally with the speed of light, uh, nearly with no dissipations, because uh, the uh, the um, optical fibers that we use for. Uh, telecommunication for transferring optical signals, they nearly uh, do not absorb any light. And this is, of course, very different from what we had, say, 30, 50 years ago, when information was communicated with the help of electri electric uh, wires and the help of electric uh, signals with a lot of dissipations. And then it, it took uh, much longer and the quality of data transfer was uh, obviously lower. But today, uh, we can easily transfer information at rates roughly one bit per picosecond, or simply speaking, at terahertz, terahertz, uh, terahertz rates. And all this information goes towards, most of this information goes towards data centers. So the next question is whether data centers are able to keep up with these uh, rates of information transfer. Apparently not. And data centers uh, are now experiencing difficult times. Uh, there is a, the flow of information towards data centers is so intense that they are becoming uh, the biggest consumers of uh, electricity in the world. So already these uh, days, uh, according to different estimates, they consume from five to from two to five percent of all the electricity produced in the world. And then you can ask yourself a question: uh, If there was a revolution in uh, telecommunication and data transfer, uh, and the revolution was facilitated with the help of photonics, whether photonics can help us also make mag magnetic uh, data storage fast? And then two fundamental questions that we uh, have formulated uh, at this slide, I would like to discuss also in the talk, uh, in this lecture. Uh, can we control the magnetization with the help of light? And can we do it as fast as, uh, as the fastest data transfer? So well, even not even uh, here, I put not even the fastest as a, as a reference, say uh, 100 gigabit, uh, gigabit per, per, per second is not uh, something spectacular these days already. But if you transfer information with this bit, and if you want to record this, it would mean that we will need to uh, write a single bit within 10 picoseconds, whether it is possible or not. Okay, so that's, I, as I promised, I would like to discuss these questions and uh, think about those and what it means also from fun, for fundamental science. But let me first review uh, history of magnetism and a history of classical magnetism as we understand it uh, today. Uh, because uh, actually magnetism was one of the most fascinating uh, uh, effects which was uh, explored in the 20th century. I would say that uh, the many breakthroughs in condensed metaphysics in the 20th century were done uh, in magnets, in, in, in studies of magnets. Well, first of all, uh, magnets are known from ancient times. So also all in the, uh, in, in, in the centuries of uh, anti-Greeks, uh, 
culture, people knew already about the existence of these magic, uh, magic stones that could, were able to attract other stones. And uh, apparently, as a matter of fact, till the end of 19th century, we knew that the magnets exist. If you look at the periodic table, we could identify three elements in the periodic table, which are magnetic at room temperature, iron, cobalt, and nickel. If you increase temperature of these elements, uh, then they lose their magic properties to attract other objects. So that's, they lose the property to produce magnetic field. Uh, they don't um, interact with other magnets via this magnetic field. And then this property to produce magnetic field was described by, this, by the special quantity, which we started to call magnetization, M. So this magnetization decreases as a function of temperature and eventually disappears at so-called Curie temperature. The Curie temperature for these elements and uh, in the periodic table, iron, cobalt, and nickel is, is very high. So for iron, for instance, it's uh, above 1,000 Kelvin. Also for cobalt, it's above 1,000 Kelvin. At these temperatures, it's, a, it's far above uh, any life can exist. Um, and uh, for a long time, magnetism was seen as a magic. So there was, it was no explanation in physics why magnets are able to attract other objects. And the breakthrough and understanding of magnetism came only with the development of quantum mechanics. And there's a very interesting theory about a uh, very interesting history, so this, sorry, about uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the most important, so to say, uh, one of the most important discoveries in quantum mechanics. And this is discovery of spin. So I think the discovery of spin was the beginning of modern uh, culture, uh, modern, modern theory of magnetism, because it was realized that uh, elementary magnetic moment is actually angular momentum of an electron, fourth quantum number, spin of electron. <coughs> an interesting history interesting story which uh, which uh, which is associated with this discovery I try to uh, reflect on this slide because if you look if you read the textbooks normally the discovery of spin is assigned uh, to Pauli uh, and not normally and theoretically so to say what we learn when we uh, when we uh, when we uh, uh, first read about spin we uh, read definition given by Pauli uh, about this uh, about spin, so this is uh, two valuedness uh, two valuedness uh, quantity which doesn't have a classical analogy, which is not described classically. Uh, however, uh, it's already it, it's uh, less known, but still it is the fact. When Pauli heard about spin, the concept of spin for the first time, he said that it is of course cl clever idea, but it has nothing to do with reality. So the story is the following: so the very first person who came up with the idea of spin was Kronik. So he was uh, a student from, uh, I've forgotten which, but one of American universities, and he was uh, visiting Leiden. So during his stays uh, in uh, Europe, um, he also communicating with uh, uh, scientists and also he, he shared this idea of having, of electron having spin with Pauli and Pauli responded in this, uh, in a quite critical way. And, but nevertheless, um, the, this idea was somewhere in the air and uh, in Leiden where Kronik was exactly the, uh, visiting uh, in the laboratory, which was visited by uh, Kronik at the time. Uh, it was eventually picked up by uh, uh, two other young guys, uh, Ullenbeck and Hausmith, and they shared their ideas with uh, their supervisor, Paul Ehrenfest, and their supervisor supported them. Uh, so they said, okay, it's, it's very interesting idea to develop and, he supported them, but he didn't become co-author on the papers. And eventually, Ullenbeck and Hausmith convinced Pauli that spin should exist. And eventually, we came, uh, we, 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 uh, Pauli came to this uh, definition that we all know from the textbooks. And afterwards, the history, uh, the, uh, afterwards, the theory of magnetism was developing uh, even in a breathtaking fashion. Well, very soon after, the, after that, Heisenberg and Dirac realized that uh, if you look at the electron-electron interaction, it's actually spin-dependent. It's not only charge-dependent, as we learned from classical physics, it's spin-dependent. And two electrons with uh, anti-parallel alignment of spins interact differently than two electrons with arbit arbitrary orientation of spins. And they proposed to define the energy of this spin-dependent uh, part of the electron-electron interaction with a very simple expression, just color product of two spins and exchange constant J. If you ask me why uh, they came up with the idea of uh, to describe this exchange interaction, this uh, spin-dependent part of the electron-electron interaction in this form, the answer is very simple. It cannot be easier. So if you, uh, the, uh, if you expand the energy 
of uh, electron, and, electron interaction with respect to spin and Taylor series, this would be the very first term that we have to take into account. So they've taken this into account. And apparently uh, in, more, uh, in, in the absolute majority of the experiments, uh, you would be uh, absolutely satisfied with this definition of the exchange interaction. Where uh, you can see here a scalar product of two spins and exchange constant J. And if exchange constant is uh, positive, then uh, exchange interaction favors uh, this uh, spin dependent part of the electron electron interaction, they, once they started to call exchange interaction, then this exchange interaction favors uh, mutually parallel alignment of spins. And what we have here is a ferromagnet. By the way, this Curie temperature was found to be uh, defined by the uh, exchange constant. And from here, you can see uh, that since the Curie temperature can be extremely high, you can even claim that magnetism is actually the strongest quantum mechanical phenomenon, at least at our planet. Then uh, uh, looking further, soon after that, uh, Louis Niel realized that next to materials with positive exchange constant, you can also have materials with negative exchange constant. And he proposed the concept of an antiferromagnet. So if in ferromagnet, all spins are pointing in one direction, an antiferromagnet, uh, the spins uh, are aligned mutually anti-parallel one with respect to another. And soon after that, uh, he also proposed the concept of ferry magnet, which is very similar. Quantum mechanically, it's actually as a ferma anti ferromagnet because it has, anti, uh, it has exchange interaction, which favors anti-parallel alignment of spins. But um, in, uh, since uh, magnetic sublattices, uh, the, the spins pointing up and spins pointing down are not equivalent. So they simply uh, made uh, the spins simply belong to different chemical elements for instance, like gadolinium and iron. Uh, so since they, they are not equivalent, the net magnetization of ferry magnet is not zero. And uh, of course, this was uh, quantum mechanical theory. And uh, if you want to describe a real macroscopic object, it would be too challenging if you want to start immediately from quantum mechanics. We need simplifications. We need approximations. And then another uh, famous quote, which I like a lot, is a quote from uh, Lea Flandau. Um, it says that the most important part of doing physics is the knowledge of approximations. And um, the, the, uh, the physics of magnetism that we find in textbooks uh, today, it says very little about quantum mechanical uh, uh, basics of magnetism. And most of the equations that we use, they're basically written uh, using terms, uh, uh, they're re basically written in, uh, written in terms of classical physics. And uh, this transition between quantum and classic physics became possible due to proper approximations. What in particular Landau did, he wrote uh, the first law of thermodynamics. So this is internal energy. This is what performed on the system. This is uh, heat transferred to the system. Then a work performed on the system and the world of magnetism is uh, given by product of magnetic field and uh, change of magnetization. From that, you can define effective magnetic field experienced by spins in the medium, and it would be just a uh, derivative of the internal energy with respect to the magnetization. And this derivative should be taken at constant entropy, uh, such that uh, you, we can exclude, uh, assuming the entropy is constant, we can exclude the heat uh, from the consideration of the problem. Then uh, after that, we see that um, actually the physical meaning of electron spin is an angular momentum. So what, uh, what was suggested to introduce, to simplify description of uh, magnetism, it was suggested to introduce macro uh, parameters, so to say macro spin parameters. Like for instance, in the case of ferromagnet, uh, we can take sum of all spins over the whole sample divided by volume. And this, is, this would be what we call magnetization. In case of anti-ferromagnet, magnetization is zero, but we can define macro spin differently uh, using so-called Niel vector. Instead of calculating sum of all spins, we will calculate difference of uh, neighboring spins. And uh, in this case, we will introduce a uh, vector L, a uh, vector of anti-ferromagnetism or Niel vector. And uh, very interesting here and counterintuitive uh, object, of course, is a ferry magnet, which quantum mechanically, as I said, looks like anti-ferromagnet, but classically, if you perform experiments in, in the lab, you will observe it as if it is in a ferromagnetic material because it has non-zero net magnetization. 
And then since microspin is introduced, macros, uh, macroscopic order parameter, which is also called, uh, uh, this microspin is also called microscopic uh, order parameter is introduced. Then what we have to do to describe magnetization dynamics or spin dynamics, dynamics in the system, we have to write one, we have to write well-known equations of motion. And for the spin, it would be uh, basically conservation of angular momentum because physical origin of spins, physical essence of spin is an angular momentum. So we start from the conservation of angular momentum. We uh, calculate uh, from the angular momentum, we calculate magnetization and uh, define the torque acting on the magnetization. And here, uh, what, what is important that effective magnetic field that defines basically the torque acting on the magnetization can be defined thermodynamically as we did here. So basically this equation got the name of uh, landau lifritz equation and it has been the, one of the main equations in description of dynamics of magnetism or magnetization dynamics uh, in physics so far. Uh, so if you look at the textbooks on magnetization dynamics, it's simply impossible to imagine the textbook uh, explains magnetization dynamics without in involving landau lifritz equation. But as I said, landau lifritz equation is just conservation of angular momentum and it's written in, the, in terms of uh, uh, thermodynamics. Well, the thing is that this macro spin, uh, this approximation, this, uh, uh, the, this uh, approximation that eventually allows us to work not with individual spins, but with macroscopic order parameter, which is called macro spin. Uh, this approximation has its borders, so to say. It has uh, borders within which it can be applied. Look here, uh, imagine that this is the time scale. Yeah, this is the X time axis, sorry. This is time axis. Then we have ferromagnets, ferrimagnets, antiferromagnets, and for each of those, we defined microscopic order parameter, macroscopy. Then now let's see uh, how much time we need to, um, to well, what, what would be the time scale at which we can use microscopic order parameter for the description of physics of magnetism. Obviously, it should be time scale, which is much longer than the characteristic time at which one spin learn about the existence of its uh, neighbors. For instance, this spin uh, feels um, exchange interaction from this spin. How much time it takes before this spin learns about the neighbor? In order to find it, we calculate the effective magnetic field that originates from the exchange interaction. And the effective magnetic field can be calculated simply taking energy of the exchange interaction and taking derivative of this energy with respect to spin, then effective magnetic field that you will be able to calculate in this way would be in the range from one Tesla, but this is for very weak magnets, to 1000 Tesla, which is already serious field, uh, which is, uh, well, it can be generated on the earth, uh, it can be generated on our planet, but then it, it, would, uh, it, can, it, it is normally generated by exploding magnets. So the field that we have, for instance, in Magna and here in, in Nijmegen in the famous high field magnetic laboratory, these are reaching uh, 40 Tesla, 38 Tesla at the moment. So talking about exchange fields of 1000 Tesla, uh, it's talking about huge fields. So this uh, exchange field can reach uh, 1000 Tesla. So then imagine that now uh, this exchange field acts on the spins, action on magnetization and how spin would uh, behave under the action of this effective magnetic field, the spin, of course, will process. There will be Larmor precession. And the period of Larmor precession can be found from this landau lifshitz equation and uh, taking uh, this constant gamma um, uh, for, for instance, free electron, we will be able to calculate this gamma is roughly 28 gigahertz per Tesla. So it means that if you put here from one to thousand Tesla, the period of the Larmor precession would be of the order, uh, order uh, would be somewhere between 30 femtosecond and 30 picosecond. So basically, it means that uh, once imagine that your switch exchange field on, it takes 30 from 30 femtosecond to 30 picosecond before the spin uh, will start feeling its neighbors due to the exchange field. So the statement I would like to make that you can use micro spin approximation and uh, without expecting a violation of this approximation, only on the time scale, which is, which is much longer than the characteristic time of the exchange interaction, which is defined as the period of Lama precession of spin in the exchange field. So if the time scale of the problem 
is much longer than 30 femtosecond, 30 picosecond, depending on the strength of the exchange field. You can use this macro spin approximation and uh, describe magnet in terms of uh, magnetization or antiferromagnetic order parameter. But if you push the time scale to femtosecond, to pick a second time scale, uh, to, take, to, to pick a second um, region, macro spin approximation can fail in principle. And it means that new physics, uh, there is a chance th th that new physics will be absorbed, uh, absor absorbed. Another way to look at this uh, ultra fast, at this, uh, so to say, a field, uh, a rather an explored field of ultra fast magnetism is to look at the problem thermodynamically. So here I have time axis. Here um, uh, you can see the characteristic time scale of excitation. Imagine we excite medium at the time scale of 100 femtoseconds. And when you excite medium on the time scale of 100 femtoseconds, we should realize that such an excitation will bring the medium into strongly non equilibrium state where conventional description of magnetic phenomena in terms of thermodynamics and terms of macro spin approximation in particular is no longer valid. If you want to use thermodynamics, you have to wait at least 100 picoseconds until processes of thermalization will be completed, until the medium reaches its thermodynamic equilibrium. But before that, we have rather unexplored territory in modern magnetism. And I like to repeat, this is terra incognita of modern science. And that's why it's so, we are so interested in studying this terra incognita, studying this ultra fast magnetism. And the interest of this field is not only fundamental because if you look at the development of nowadays technologies uh, and how they were developing over the last uh, decades, uh, for instance, magnetic data storage, magnetic memory, they became faster and faster. And now presently they reach the time scale of 100 picosecond, uh, one nanosecond. If you want to push these technologies ever further, if you want to see ever faster uh, uh, magnetic memory and data storage, we simply must study this new fundamental physics of ultra fast magnetism already today. So hopefully there will be technologies in 50 years, but first we have to understand these fundamentals and these terra incognita of modern science. How would we understand them? We will need stimuli, we will need excitations. And the problem number one is that uh, actually the most conventional excitation to study magnetization dynamics, electromagnet, will not help us here simply because magnetic pulses, uh, uh, the, magnetic, the pulses of magnetic fields shown enough to uh, substantially uh, affect magnetization, uh, they have, I mean, it's nearly impossible to generate them tabletop uh, and in the lab uh, on a table in tabletop experiments with durations uh, much shorter than one nanosecond. So basically if you do experiments with short pulses of magnetic field, you will be uh, limited to this region simply because excitation that you use is that slow. Then, uh, in fact, aiming to, to understand ever faster spin dynamics, people, people even use Stanford linear accelerator, which was not even built for uh, condensed matter uh, research. But nevertheless, here, uh, people realize that uh, bunches relativistic, of relativistic electrons uh, that, uh, uh, that are generated in this and accelerate in this state of accelerator, uh, they are able to generate magnetic uh, short pulses of magnetic fields with duration down to one, uh, one picosecond, even shorter than one picosecond. And in this work in particular, people studied uh, magnetization, the result of, uh, uh, they started ultra fast magnetism looking at the result of excitation of magnets with such short pulses of magnetic field. But looking at all stimuli, uh, excite, all possible excitations available in condensed matter physics today, we cannot ignore existence of laser pulses. So laser pulses from commercial systems can be very short. They can be much shorter than 100 femtoseconds or even shorter than 10 femtoseconds. We even have such a system in our lab. It's not a, it's, um, well, it's a commercial system which uh, one can buy and it will be delivered in a couple of months. It's um, not as unique as 10 foot linear accelerator, for instance. So that everybody can do experiments with uh, femtosecond laser pulses. Uh, why don't we use femtosecond laser pulses to control magnets? Well, first, and then the first question is, can femtosecond uh, flash of light affect magnetism? Uh, first answer is uh, obviously, because uh, whatever effect of light on matter we can speculate about, we cannot ignore the fact that light can simply hit medium. Light can, uh, uh, can uh, inject uh, energy into the medium and um, 
deposit energy into the medium and in this way increase temperature of uh, the medium of the magnet and in this way uh, ultra short laser pulse will act as an ultra fast heater but also thermodynamically uh, we if we do if we use the very same trick as i showed before we start with the first law of thermodynamics we write energy of light matter interaction we take derivative of the internal energy with respect to the magnetization at constant entropy. And you will see that in principle, effective magnetic field can be also generated by light. Simply by symmetry, this effect uh, the, um, here, in order to satisfy symmetry with respect to time reversal, on the uh, right and left uh, side of, uh, of this equation, uh, should reverse sign, uh, should behave uh, similarly under uh, operation of time reversal. So, and then if, 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 if magnetic field reverses sign, on the operation of time reversal, it means that this product should also reverse sign, and it means that this uh, product must be uh, combined, must, must be uh, produced by circularly polarized light. So this is some sy symmetry trick. If you like, we can discuss it afterwards, even during uh, uh, during the uh, uh, workshop. I'm, I'm sure there will be plenty of people who will be able to, to explain this to you, but we can discuss it today. Uh, at the moment, I would like to focus on two things. Uh, so laser, laser pulse, can affect magnets, either heating it or acting as effective magnetic field. And uh, there is nothing special, as I said, of uh, having laser pulses uh, as short as 10 femtosecond. Actually, one of the first lasers which was uh, produced, which was made, generated pulses already of uh, with duration of 10 picoseconds. And uh, then uh, afterwards, here you can see evolution of lasers. You can see that in the ears, the duration of the pulse uh, produced by lasers uh, continuously decreased. And these days, as I said, it's nothing special to have uh, laser pulses shorter than 10 per second. And we can even say that laser pulse is the shortest stimulus in experimental physics. It's the shortest excitation that we have available in, in experimental physics. And uh, with these laser pulses, we can study ultra fast, we can study ultra fast magnetism. We can excite magnets at the ultra short time scale. But also with the very same laser pulse, we can probe uh, ultra fast magnetization dynamics. And the problem of ultra fast magnetization dynamics would uh, the principle of probing would be uh, very similar to the principle of making very first movie. So here uh, I show you a postcard from more than 100 years ago when there was another fundamental question: how the horse, uh, uh, how a horse runs, so whether it takes all four legs off the ground or not. And in order to answer this question, people put a number of photo cameras with flash, and then the flash was triggered at a certain moment when a horse was passing by. And in this way, they made a series of pictures when they collected all these pictures together. They found, basically they made the very first movie and then they were able to, uh, to see that indeed horse takes all four legs uh, of the ground. Uh, and uh, the only difference with this uh, uh, movie, which was done with millisecond, uh, temporal resolution that instead of flash, we use femtosecond laser pulse. And instead of millisecond temporal resolution, we obtain femtosecond temporal resolution. But the, the rest of principles are very same that we use femtosecond laser pulse to excite medium. And we use femtosecond laser pulse as a flash for photo camera. And then with properly delaying pump and probe pulses, uh, we can make spin movies of materials. And this was a maybe too long introduction. Uh, yes, see, then I will go uh, faster through the results now, emphasizing what is so special about ultrafast magnetism. The very first example of ultrafast magnetic phenomena, uh, uh, very first discovery of ultrafast magnetic phenomena was done uh, nearly 20 years ago. And before that, there was another paper, say, uh, as you can see here, 30 years ago, uh, the uh, people studied gadolinium. They heated gadolinium with a short laser pulse. Pulse duration was at the range of one nanosecond. And what they observed, they, uh, what they observed could be easily explained in very simple thermodynamic terms, like energy is first deposited to electronic system, then electrons interact with uh, phonons on the time scale of spin lattice interaction within one picosecond, and then for the lattice on the time scale of spin lattice, and, uh, 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 spin lattice interaction interacts, uh, they exchange energies, and eventually you deposit energy into the electrons on the time scale of 100 picoseconds, 
the energy is shared between electrons and lattice and lattice and spins such that the temperatures are equilibrated. And once you increase temperature of spins, you will observe uh, a decrease of magnetization uh, in full agreement with thermodynamic uh, understanding of the problem. Uh, it, was, it appeared to be completely, uh, it's a complete shock to society when the very same experiment was repeated with 100 femtosecond pulses in 1996, then uh, actually nearly 30 years ago, uh, that uh, then they excited with 100 femtosecond pulses, what they observed could be explained in this three temperature model only if you assume that electrons exchange energy with spins, which sounds a little bit as a nonsense because Ele here we are talking about spins which belong to this electron. So don't ask me how we can inter interpret this in detail. But if you assume that uh, we uh, the medium is described by three reservoirs, reservoirs of electrons which can which we can uh, temperature of which we can increase, reservoir of the lattice, and uh, reservoir of spins, the temperature of spins will define net magnetization. Then the experimental results were. Uh, we could only explain, explain experimental results if we assume that there is a, a special channel uh, opened up uh, by this excitation. And this channel ensures that there is energy exchange between electrons and spins on a time scale of 100 femtoseconds. This was a discovery. It was the beginning of ultrafast magnetism. And in particular, what they saw is that uh, they took nickel, they excite nickel with uh, 100 femtosecond laser pulse, and they observed that magnetization of nickel decreases at a time scale less than one picosecond, uh, nearly to 50%, and then slowly recovers. So magnetization decreases. It means temperature of spins increased. And, um, uh, and it means that the, 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 there was a fact of uh, energy exchange between electrons and spins. Although in thermodynamics, we, in equilibrium thermodynamics, we, uh, we would expect that energy exchange will take much longer, 100 femtoseconds. 100 picoseconds, sorry. So this was the beginning of ultrafast magnetism. And uh, afterwards, uh, it became even more interesting because uh, what I showed so far was ultrafast demagnetization. But if you take circularly polarized laser pulse and put, take the linear iron cobalt, which is already ferry magnet, the one that I showed before, um, uh, the, the, the experiment that I showed before were done on ferromagnetic nickel. Here we take ferri, uh, ferri magnetic uh, gadolinium iron cobalt, which can be modeled as consistent of two magnetic sublattices, sublattice of gadolinium and sublattice of iron, and they are coupled anti-parallel. And uh, if you put this material under magneto-optical microscope, it's just two cross polarizers in, your, in the microscope, you will see uh, black and white areas, and black areas correspond to areas with magnetization up, and white areas correspond to the areas with magnetization down. So what we did, we scanned beam a very, a laser beam very slowly across the sample. And um, uh, since laser beam was uh, consisting of uh, 40 femtosecond laser pulses with repetition rate one kilohertz, so basically one every millisecond, we had a uh, laser pulse at the sample. So that picture that I will show you would, was a result of action of several pulses. And we took circularly polarized, uh, right-handed circularly polarized laser pulse, pulses, and we got switching of black domain. And we took uh, left-handed circularly polarized laser pulses, and we, will, uh, we got switching of white domain. So circularly polarized light acted, it looks like circularly polarized light acted as effective magnetic field, which of course was very uh, interesting. But if you stay uh, skeptical, that basically there is nothing to be surprised here because what we uh, have just, showed is that circularly polarized light can act as an effective magnetic field. There was no time scale here. So we used four, uh, 40 femtosecond laser pulses. We didn't show any dynamics. And since dynamics is not shown, and since thermodynamically circularly polarized pulse, uh, circularly polarized light has the very same symmetry as effective magnetic field, I wouldn't be too surprised looking at this picture. Surprise came afterwards. When we repeat the very same experiment, but when we scan beam very fast across the sample such that each of the pulses landed on its individual spot. And this is what we observed. So right-handed circularly polarized pulses switched white domain and left-handed circularly polarized pulses switched black domain. 
and only black and not it didn't affect the white one. So this is action of a, uh, of a single 40 femtosecond laser pulse. So we can reverse monetization with a 40 femtosecond laser pulse. Then uh, it was a long story uh, uh, how the uh, how we uh, try to understand uh, the origin of ultra fast monetization reversal. And with the following with the, showing this story, I would like to 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 convince you that. Studies of ultra fast magnetization dynamics, or studies of ultra fast magnetism need uh, right methodology. For instance, here, if you observe uh, that uh, single 40 femtosecond laser pulse reverses magnetization, it doesn't mean that magnetization is reversed within 40 femtoseconds. And this was the very first lesson that we learned. So we developed uh, ultra fast imaging so that, such that we uh, uh, made uh, this uh, spin movie with a femtosecond temporal resolution. We repeated experiments for domains with monetization up, monetization down, and with two helicities of light. And you can see here that switching takes much longer. So this monetization reversal takes up to 100 picosecond, although uh, laser pulse was just 40 femtoseconds short. Moreover, if you look at this range of uh, 10 picoseconds, you see that all the curves, all the images, sorry, they are identical. So it's something else is going on, which we don't see here. And um, at that point, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't know what is going on. And uh, intuitively we thought, okay, so since it's a gadolinium iron cobalt and this measurement's done in visible spectral range and the visible spectral range, we only see a sublattice of iron we try to uh, model the spin dynamics uh, by modeling simply uh, sublattice of iron like an ensemble of uh, spins. Uh, then we put this ensemble of spins in the hot in, in the in the, in the bath, which mimics uh, free electrons. And this bath was coupled to another bath, which mimics lattice. So then we increase temperature of electrons by uh, pumping. Uh, uh, by, by increased temperature of electrons. And this way we describe uh, ultra fast pumping uh, of, uh, of the material. And uh, on the top of this, we mimic the action of circular polarized light, switching magnetic field on, effective magnetic field on. And uh, this, the, what we did, we basically simulate uh, one million, uh, one, uh, one, uh, behavior of one million of spins, simply writing one million of landau lietrous equations uh, and this we did in collaboration with our colleagues with, um, in, uh, from York. Uh, There's a group of Roy Chantrell. And the results of the simulations that were done in New York as shown on this slide, in principle, they were able to reproduce what we see, what we see experimentally. So depending on the magnetic field, uh, you uh, either completely demagnetize the sample and it, uh, then it goes in the opposite direction or uh, slightly, um, or you move uh, material in slightly uh, magnetized state, and then it recovers in the opposite direction uh, for, the, for the opposite effective magnetic field. Qualitatively, we were able to reproduce this data. The problem was that the effective magnetic field that you had to switch on uh, here in this experiment was 20 Tesla. Don't ask me why the effective magnetic field produced by light can be that strong, because it's already comparable uh, with a spin orbit interaction, with a, it becomes close to the change interaction. It's comparable with a magnetic fields generated in high magnetic field, uh, in high field magnetic laboratory here in Nijmegen. So it was one question if the fields generated by circular polarized light are that strong. Uh, the second question, we had no idea why, uh, why uh, the, 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 this experiment, this, sorry, these simulations worked only with a relatively long pulses with duration 250 femtoseconds. Uh, and, uh, and then if in the simulations, if made pulses shorter, uh, then 200 femtoseconds, and particularly as short as 40 femtoseconds here in the experiment, it simply didn't work. So we had to really stretch all the parameters to get it to get it uh, uh, working in the simulations. And here in these simulations, of course, we didn't reproduce any behavior of gadolinium, since this is this is gadolinium iron cobalt. Uh, uh, the material uh, of gadolinium iron co uh, consists of gadolinium iron cobalt. This is alloy. And here in the visible spectral range, we only saw behavior of iron. We didn't see gadolinium. We had no idea what gadolinium is doing. And uh, funny thing that when we try to answer the third question, we found answers on the first two. 
And uh, actually, to, in order to see the behavior of gadolinium, we had to go to synchrotron, where you can measure magnetization dynamics from gadolinium in the X-ray spectral range and magnetization dynamics of iron. So simply uh, looking at different electronic transitions, you can uh, clearly separate whether you observe a signal from one chemical element or a different chemical element in the X-ray spectral range. Uh, transitions that you observe uh, in spectroscopy, they work simply as a fingerprint. So then uh, going to specific uh, photon energy, you, you're able to look only at the behavior of gadolinium or only the behavior of iron. And what we saw that uh, the gadolinium practically has different spin dynamics than, uh, than iron. Now it means that if you model behavior of gadolinium and iron, you're not allowed to model this as a, uh, with a, a set of landau lewis equations of one type. You had to add second type of landau lewis equations, which will mimic behavior of gadolinium. And when uh, our colleagues in New York did it, uh, they actually, in the first place, they became uh, very sad uh, because it appeared that you don't need any magnetic field at all. And it looked in the first place as if uh, there was a big, big mistake in the, in the, in the former simulations because magnetization even switches with no magnetic field. Just if you increase temperature of free electrons, each time af after the temperature of free, of free electrons increases, magnetization is reversed. For instance, here, so this is the temperature of free electrons. It see, uh, you see it goes to very high values because heat capacity of electrons is low. And then temperature of electrons relaxes on the time scale of electron phenomenon interaction. But after each event of temperature increase, magnetization of iron and gadolinium is reversed. And the net magnetization reverses as well. So this was first uh, surprise, <laughs> not the first already, next surprise. And fortunately, we had already in the lab very interesting results that confirmed that even if you don't take circularly polarized light and excite the medium with linearly polarized light, simply increase temperature of electrons, each time after the excitation, uh, if uh, you have magnetization reversal, which we started to call toggle switching, first pulse reverse magnetization, you give the second pulse, you, the magnetization is reversed back, et cetera, et cetera. And since we use here un, uh, linearly polarized pulses and the effect didn't depend on the polarization of light, we showed that in fact, uh, the, uh, this laser induced magnetization reversal in this case uh, should be interpreted as a laser induced magnetization reversal that was mainly uh, induced due to ultra fast heating of the medium with the help of uh, laser pulse. We also repeat this on different type of magnets. So here you can see microstructures within in-plane, out-of-plane anisotropy. And the model that, that we realize that the model here is, is very interesting and very uh, counterintuitive. The model that explains the effect. So it is very similar to a problem uh, about which here Niels Bohr and uh, Wolfgang Pauli are thinking, looking at the uh, tip-top uh, 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 toy. Uh, which, uh, if you haven't seen it, it it, it flips when you when it uh, when it spins at certain moments. It flips, uh, 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 and uh, reverses its its poles. So what happens here? So we have gadolinium, we have iron. We increase temperature of the surroundings of gadolinium and iron, and we launch demagnetization. So that magnetization of iron should be destroyed. Magnetization of gadolinium should be destroyed. Then magnetization of iron decreases. And imagine that we uh, push the medium into the states where magnetization of iron is nearly destroyed and magnetization of gadolinium is not. In fact, although it sounds weird, but it's easy, relatively easy to realize because spin of uh, one gadolinium atom is larger than the spin of one iron atom. And it takes it, it's simply easier to reverse one spin of iron than one spin of gadolinium because it costs less angular momentum. Then if in, increase temperature in, of the environment, both gadolinium and iron loses, uh, lose their magnetizations, but iron will lose it faster. So, and eventually system will arrive into this state. Imagine that at this point, temperature of the surroundings decreased, for instance, due to electron phenomenon interaction, and the system should find a way to one of metastable states. So this is certainly, it's, uh, this is a state in which system is not happy. It costs a lot of uh, exchange energy. So it, it, it costs a lot of 
energy uh, of the exchange interaction between iron ions, because they are not aligned parallel one respect to another, uh, iron sublattice is demagnetized. Iron sublattice wants to restore its initial magnetization. So iron sublattice wants to go either to this state or to this state. And it appears that if the nature uh, proceeds along this route, it will cost the whole system less angular momentum simply because net angular momentum here is pointing up and then net angular momentum here is also pointing up. And now if you look at the whole evolution, you can see here magnetization, net angular momentum was pointing down. Then we destroy magnetization of iron, let the system relax, and it will arrive to the state with magnetization reversed. So each time we increase temperature of electrons, each time we bring the system uh, of um, uh, uh, spins of gadolinium and iron out of equilibrium one with respect to another, we can reverse magnetization. And eventually uh, the helicity dependence can be explained in a rather easy way. Uh, if you take a material with so-called magnetic circular dichroism, when right and left handed circular polarized uh, light is absorbed differently, you can, uh, and you tune the intensity of light such that uh, we are at the threshold of switching. For instance, you take linearly polarized light and you observe switching uh, for high intensities. You do not observe switching for low intensities. And now we switch to circularly polarized light. Right can the circularly polarized light absorb more and we will see, uh, uh, sorry, absorb less and then we'll see switching at high intensities. Left can the circularly polarized light is absorbed uh, 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 more and then we see the switching at the, uh, low intensities. And then if you see in, in, in this hysteresis, you can observe helicity dependent switching. So this story, it was um, and, uh, one of the stories I wanted to tell you that to show that, first of all, ultra fast uh, magnetism is counterintuitive. Secondly, there are plenty of opportunities to make mistake if you don't use a right methodology. And thirdly, right methodology would be a methodology that really shows you the dynamics and preferably also uh, imaging uh, of the, uh, 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 make sure that you get an image of the material and show that there is indeed a switching of the magnetization from state up uh, to state down. So let me skip this. Uh, well, here's a few examples that in principle, uh, this mechanism of laser induced magnetization reversal inspired uh, different effects. Uh, like shown here, since laser induced magnetization reversal is uh, driven by heat, it's basically uh, ultra fast heating by introduced by laser pulse. The very same ultra fast heating can be introduced by a uh, short pulse of electric current, as was shown on this on this uh, in this work. Our colleagues from Berkeley and uh, Professor Bokotra, by the way, will give a seminar in uh, half an hour, I see, at our university. So that. Uh, as shown here, if you give very short pulse of electric fields, uh, you can reverse magnetization as well. So the mechanism would be very similar, just heating of free electrons will be, uh, um, will be realized not due to the uh, uh, laser excitation, but due to the uh, ultra fast uh, uh, sending of a uh, short pulse of uh, electric current. And uh, I think since we're talking already long, I would like to show you uh, that in principle, we can uh, do repetitive switching, switching back and forth. So here on this slide, I show that we can switch uh, right and rewrite information with two pulses separated by 500 picosecond. Today, it's also, I mean, there the, the, the have been experiments published uh, claiming that you can write and rewrite magnetic bits at the, uh, at the time scale of 10 picoseconds. So it's getting, getting very close to the landmark, which we uh, put. Uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, and then we also worked very hard on uh, switching not only metals, but dielectric materials where uh, ultra fast magnetization reversal, ultra fast writing of magnetic bits was uh, arranged not due to the ultra fast heating of free electrons, but by controlling magnetic anisotropy, like in these uh, magnetic dielectrics. Obviously, in magnetic dielectrics, there are no free electrons. That's why we can include this uh, mechanism of ultra fast heating, which I showed on the previous, in the previous part of the lecture. So I will skip this. Uh, mainly, these experimental results showing uh, only probably that we, with the help of uh, short laser pulses, we can also write information of on uh, yttrium iron garnet. This is classical magnetic dielectric by controlling magnetic anisotropy, and we can do this. Uh, 
Let's see. Uh, yes, we can do this at the frequency of uh, 220 gigahertz, basically uh, by pulses separated by just uh, 50 picosecond. So every 50 picosecond, we can write a bit, which is again very close to the landmark. And um, well, in case you are interested, uh, since we're already running out of time, you can uh, also look uh, for more information about uh, ways to write information with the help of light in the review we published uh, two years ago, where we explained uh, and ultra fast experiments on uh, uh, writing information with the help of light and um, historical introduction and uh, uh, to this problem and phenomenological like, description of the problem and of course latest experiments. And uh, finally, what is uh, most relevant for the meeting uh, so far uh, in this lecture, what I showed you that in principle, if you enter the field of ultra fast magnetism, the field is full of surprises. And in particular, we can write magnetic bits and the bits will be written at the time scale of 50 picoseconds. But, um, or time scale of, well, we can reach the time scale of 10 picosecond, but in the end, we cannot beat, uh, so to say, uh, too much something that we know from macro spin approximation. And the macro spin approximation, uh, we, we can look at the problem of uh, laser inducement, uh, or problem of magnetic recording in the macro spin approximation and seeing that, okay, if writing a magnetic bit on a ferromagnet, on a theory magnet, corresponds rotation of spins of 180 degrees, this rotation of spins of 180 degrees would be defined by the frequency of spin resonance. So it's natural that for the fastest uh, spin reorientation, you will induce spin, uh, you will employ spin resonance. And since the frequency of spin resonance in ferrim and ferromagnets is in gigahertz range, it's not surprising that uh, what we could observe as a time scale of the switching was also at the time scale of 10 picoseconds, but not faster. If you really want to get into the fastest possible writing of magnetic bits, you have to go to materials with terahertz frequencies of spin resonance where we can reorient spins on a time scale of one picosecond because period of spin resonance here is one picosecond. And the materials where period of spin resonance is one picosecond, these are not ferromagnets that are not ferrimagnets, these are anti-ferromagnets. So knowing this field, it's already uh, then since uh, after learning how to switch ferrimagnetic material, it's simply the next natural step to learn how to switch anti-ferromagnets. And as I showed, uh, as, as I just discussed, that we, we hope that if we try to switch anti-ferromagnet, it can be done much faster than if in the case of ferromagnet, and we can reach this landmark of, uh, uh, of uh, recording information at terahertz rates. But once you're thinking about this problem of switching anti-ferromagnets at the ultra short time scale, actually you realize that Ultra fast anti ferromagnetism is even more fascinating than uh, ferry magnetism. Well, first of all, anti ferromagnet out of equilibrium is practically a different material. In the, it is in thermodynamic equilibrium that anti ferromagnet has no net magnetization. Out of equilibrium, anti ferromagnet will acquire magnetization. Uh, exchange interaction acting between the spins will be time dependent. If anti ferromagnet acquired magnetization, well, in principle, it's a good question. Uh, what is the role of the lattice and the ground state? Uh, the, um, there is no magnetization in the excited state. There is magnetization where this, since magnetization is the angular momentum, where this magnetization actually came from. A plenty of questions in this unexplored field of ultra fast anti ferromagnetism, which we would like to address during the symposium. But while addressing those questions, we have to keep in mind what has been done already. And what has been done already, this is a big field of ultra fast magnetism on ferromagnets, of course, as it was discovered first, and in ferromagnets where we could even reverse magnetization. And uh, well, so it took longer than I expected, but it brings me to conclusions. Uh, I hope I was able to convince you that femtosecond laser pulse opens practically terra incognitive magnetism, ultra fast magnetism. Ultra short light, light uh, flashes can write magnetic information. And there are many mechanisms to write magnetic information. Uh, uh, one of the mechanisms is to use ultra fast heating, and ultra fast heating would be different from normal heating. Another mechanism is to control magnetic anisotropy. Here, uh, there, I had to be short. 
And in that case, uh, I just can tell you that uh, in order to control magnetic anisotropy, you have to pump specific electronic transitions. What is also very important that ultrafast, ma ma ultrafast magnetism challenges the modern theories of multi sublattice magnets. So if you uh, talk about ultrafast magnetism, you break this, uh, you, have, you have a big chance to break this ma ma macro spin approximation. And it becomes especially interesting to look at the physics of uh, beyond macro spin approximation in the materials where you have different types of sublattices like ferromagnets or antiferromagnets. And I would say ferromagnets in this respect are the most boring. And the fundamental question that we have to keep in mind in, uh, for the future is that we still don't understand, we're still learning what is the most efficient and the fastest way to control magnetism in, in uh, magnetic materials and ferrum and antiferromagnets. And here we can control magnetism either electronic, phononic, or even direct spin excitations. And we try to understand which one is the best to reach the goal. And this would be the question also for, for coming decade, I think, in the field of ultrafast magnetism. And at the end, I would like to thank all my co-authors. It's a long work, so uh, if you could follow the uh, references, uh, we work uh, actually nearly 20 years on the problem of ultrafast magnetism. And then there are many people, I'm not sure I even uh, uh, acknowledge the help of uh, everybody here, but especially I would like to acknowledge uh, financial support from our network, uh, the National Training Network Comrades, and uh, National Science Foundation in the Netherlands. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very insightful and intriguing lecture. Um, if there are any questions, and I see, I see there are, I would directly forward them to you. So uh, Sumit, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you for this nice talk. So I have a question regarding L uh, Landau Lipschitz equation. So as you explained, I mean, we use it in the thermodynamic limit for macro spin. So when exactly we need to go beyond uh, this classical model and have to consider quantum mechanical description? That's a um, that's, that's very interesting question, first of all. So strictly speaking, in ultrafast magnetism, Landau Lipschitz equation, uh, well, you, 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 it's not self-speaking that Landau Lipschitz equation works, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes even uh, simply because, well, uh, simply because uh, the characteristic time scale is already comparable with the exchange interaction. So it can be that micro spin approximation fails, but it can be that it still works. So yeah. this is a question of experiments. And sometimes look, three temperature model, it's even more weird than uh, my, my Landau Lipschitz equation, but it also works. Mm -hmm. It helps to explain explain experiments, uh, but strictly speaking, if you especially if you talk about multi scale multi sublattice magnets like ferry magnets, mm -hmm. anti ferromagnetic materials, uh, and if you talk about ultra fast magnetism, I wouldn't expect that physics that we do, that we derive from Landau Lipschitz equation uh, corresponds to the experiment one to one. So I would uh, there's a big chance of deviations. Okay, yeah. and the second question is about. Uh, is it, or uh, let's say, what should I be careful about when I want to use Landau Lipschitz equation for antiferromagnet or multiple sublattice? Because as you say, it will see a macro spin, probably would not see tiny microscopic details of the full system, right? Uh, yes, uh, look, uh, what you in principle with macro spin, it's important, it's uh, methodologically not correct to, to describe uh, excitations at the edge of the brilliant zone. So with a uh, with Landau Lipschitz equation, you can even try to describe spin waves. But if you if the spin waves uh, uh, has a wavelength uh, comparable with the uh, interatomic distance, it's a mm -hmm. spin wave at the edge of the brilliant zone. It's simply methodologically not correct mm -hmm. to use uh, Landau Lipschitz equation because uh, L is not conserved in length uh, in this case. Yeah. So this is a bad bad quantity to operate with. And uh, this is basically the, the very same principle. Either the length scale becomes short or time scale becomes short, then be prepared that Landau Lipschitz equation will fail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Yeah. All right. I think there are no other questions. So please, I would like to ask you again just raise your hand. Um, I think. Uh, 
There are no further questions, so I would like to uh, thank Alexei very much for uh, this interviewing talk. And I would like uh, to close the session now and uh, thank you to everyone for attending. Yes, and we can continue, of course, at the workshop uh, <laughs> with the questions. Yeah, okay. Thank you.